Welcome to Alaska Magazine Television. Ahead, Halibut Cove Oyster Farming, Gold Rush Working Girls, A Quiet Place in the Brooks Range, and Prince William Sound a decade later. No roads run through this lush green country. Glaciers crawl down the mountains here. Water hugs the winding coastline. Bays and coves abound. 250 miles south of Anchorage, Halibut Cove adjoins Kachemak Bay. Fewer than 100 people live here. Lots of otters and eagles, fish, millions of oysters, and a handful of oyster farmers. This is a lot different than uh, dirt farming. Uh, a dirt farmer, he can get his pickup truck and drive out in the field and take a look. And he can tell if it needs to be irrigated or if he needs to fertilize. In Kevin Seidlinger's field, the crops are always under the water, right where they should be. Seidlinger is one of the five oyster farmers in Halibut Cove. We have a good area here for growing. We have a good combination of environmental conditions. We have these glaciers and uh, and as they're melting and all the sediments coming down in the form of silica, there are organisms that use silica to form themselves, which the oysters in turn eat. And uh, we also have a, an area of Kachemak Bay is considered one of the one of the most significant uh, estuaries in Alaska, and uh, it's very very nutrient rich. Oysters have been farmed on and off in Alaska since 1900. After a long slump beginning in the 50s, the market was revived in the 90s by a growing demand for high-quality half-shell oysters. Oysters that are grown in cold waters are, are really desirable, cold water oysters. And, you know, besides Alaska has a reputation uh, yeah, for clean waters, and it, and it has clean, our waters are very clean. We don't have the industry that you have uh, up upstream from the ocean. And uh, most of our industries are, are clean. We don't have a lot of manufacturing. Oysters are not indigenous here, so farmers imported their oyster seed for years. But concerns about the import quality led the University of Alaska to build an experimental oyster nursery in Halibut Cove. The research project's success became a for-profit venture run by the co-op. The nursery imports three millimeter seed, about a million at a time. They grow in these sheltered bends until they're large enough to move to the farm. Seawater, propelled by a paddle wheel, is flushed through the system, washing and feeding the growing seed. We try to maintain about two million oysters in here at a time, and uh, I decide when it's time to have a sale. We tried to get them up at about a, a size of 15 to 20 millimeter to go out on the farm. And uh, I can show you some here. These here are ready to, are ready to go. And this would be the, what we would putting in in the nets as we go out on the farm. Oh, in my hand, I have a, probably about 100 oysters. In industry standard, we're considered advanced because we have this. And uh, it's quite, a, quite an interesting thing. It's Fred Flintstone technology, but it really works. Out on the farm, the farmers may not have to feed their crop, but they are continually checking their five-tier nets, pulling up 80 pounds of rope, net and oysters out of the water over and over again. They divide the oysters up by size, redistribute them through the nets, and clean debris out of the nets to help the crop grow uniformly. The markets are so strong here in Alaska, and, and uh, right now, and uh, we have a um, majority of our, our oysters are spoken for in Alaska. We do have a couple markets outside uh, Elliott's in Seattle, and. Uh, Sampson's uh, Oyster House in uh, Philadelphia. Uh -huh. And they, they, they were kind of like some of the original customers. In August, at the peak of harvest season, they deliver live oysters to buyers twice a week. It helps farmers that their oysters are not indigenous to Alaska. 
In the summer, where native oysters are spawning, halibut cove oysters are ready for harvest. This oyster here, that here is about two and a quarter ounces, minus the mussels in the mud. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we we'll get this ready for market, what we do is we take all these mussels off, scrape these barnacles off, and uh, clean it all up. And we try to be, you have to be very careful. It's a lot of hand work. We don't want to damage this fragile edge because what you can do is chip it and open it up and the liquid will drain out. Right. And uh, that'll dry the oyster out. I'll take and I twist and I apply pressure down the hinge. And then I'll, as it slides in, we'll just pry it open and pry it up like so. Then you can look in there and you can see that, that oyster meat. And we'll just take and carefully clip that muscle and pop the top of the shell off. We scrape that loose and uh, now it's ready to eat. Kevin Seidlinger is looking ahead, but he's not rushing the future. I want to raise the half shell oyster. I want to uh, stick with one thing and try to do it better than anybody else. Right. At the moment, he's experimenting with perfection. That is really a beautiful oyster there. Look at that color and that and uh, the deep dark color. And uh, oysters are very interesting. Uh, they're not like oranges or apples. They're all very distinct and different in shape. And uh, now to me, that's a very beautiful oyster. This These one. oysters, yeah. Now that's a good oyster. Mm -hmm.